Ha 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 we thank God for another morning as he allows us to come before him even for this program this is a teaching program that the entrance of your words gives light the entrance of your words gives light and in this program we seek to teach the word of God so that we can apply it to our daily lives this morning we want to continue with the topic we started last week and we will move on from where we left off you can get this program from facebook and then also from rex van radio rex van radio has an app you can download on your phones and then you'll be able to listen to programs from the radio station. Later, this program will be available on YouTube and you can also listen from there. I want to encourage you to share it so that people can also benefit from what we are learning. Before we go on, we want to share a word of prayer. Father, once again, we come before you this morning. We open up our hearts to receive from you. We pray that you will teach us from your word. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We want to continue the topic, Lessons from Actions. Lessons from Actions. The Naaman story. The Naaman story. Lessons from Actions. The Naaman story. And as we mentioned last week, the goal of this is to pick the story of Naaman in the Bible who was a leper and he got healed later. We want to pick that story and we look at the different people that were involved in the story and then we will learn things from them. Alongside as we go, if there are anything that is worth learning something from, we will also touch on that. And before I go on, I will want to read our main passage that we read. It's a long one, but that is what we'll be reading till we finish the story. And I believe by the end of the story, and the teaching, you will be very familiar with that passage. And it's coming from 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. And it is 27 verses 1 to 27. I'm going to read all and then we will pick it from there. I read from 2 Kings chapter 5. And I'm reading from the uh, New King James Version. Now, Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus says the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised, when this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make a lie that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. 
So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. The Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to meet me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abana and the Fapa, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more than when he says to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God. He, and he returned to the man of God, he and all his eight, and came and stood before him, and he said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now therefore, please take a gift from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. So Naaman said, Then, if not, please let your servant be given two more loaves of earth, for your servant will no longer offer either burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. Yet in this thing may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the temple of Ramon, to worship there, and he leans on my hand. And I bow down in the temple of Raymond. When I bow down in the temple of Raymond, may the Lord please pardon your servant in this thing. Then he said to him, Go in peace. So he departed from him a short distance. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Look, my master has spared Naaman this Syrian. While not receiving from his hands what he brought, but as the Lord lives, I will run after him and take something from him. So Gehazi pursued Naaman. When Naaman saw him running after him, he got down from the chariot to meet him and said, It's all well. And he said, All is well, my master has sent me, saying, Indeed, just now two young men of the sons of the prophet have come to me from the mountains of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of garments. So Naaman said, Please, take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garment and handed them to two of his servants. And they carried them on ahead of him. When he came to the citadel, he took them from their hand and stored them away in the house. Then he let the men go and they departed. Now, he went in and stood before his master. Elisha said to him, Where did you go, Gehazi? And he said, Your servant did not go anywhere. Then he said to him, Did not my heart go with you? When the man turned back from his chariot to meet you, is it time to receive money and to receive clothing, olive groups and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male and female servants? Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. And he went out from his presence 
leprous as white as snow. And he went from his presence leprous as white as snow. A very sad story to note. But as I said, we are learning lessons from it. Last week, I gave an analogy, analogy about life, and I was using the traffic light to demonstrate something. When I touch on Neman's life and the challenge that he had, he was a military commander. So you will think that he had power. Yes, he had. In fact, the passage we read is saying that through him, the Lord had given victory to Syria. So we can count on Naaman and say that he has been very instrumental as far as uh, conquering nations was concerned. But then something that was going on in Naaman's life was said that even though he was a military commander and we will, we will say he was powerful, he seemed to be powerless as far as what was going on in his own life was concerned. So we see here that in life you could be powerful, you could be strong, you could be intelligent, you could be smart, you could be rich. In fact, you could be anything beautiful, handsome, name them. But that has a cap on it. In as much as you may be strong somewhere, there are other things you may have no clue and you may not have you may not have any strength. There will be nothing about you that can defend you or support you or get you out of those clutches. What am I trying to say? A military man can fight. He had leprosy. You would think he could fight. But he couldn't fight that leprosy because it was not in his power. I'm talking about life situations and I'm trying to make the point that there are things about life that we have no control and then there is nothing whatsoever that we can do about them. That is life. Which means that we will need somebody else to support us in that. We cannot do it on our own. We need somebody to support us. <laughs> if you are sick, you will need a doctor. If you have a case, a court case, the doctor may not help so much. You need a lawyer. Uh, if you want to buy things to eat, you may have to go to the grocery store. Doctors, lawyers may not help you. So every situation and the one who deals with it. I was thinking about life's challenges and sometimes we are tempted to ask ourselves, why do we even have to suffer? By the way, remember that this world has fallen, so there is nothing good that we can expect from here. But one thing that is clear and that is so, um, uh, uh, that you can miss is the fact that challenges in life make us know that we are human. In fact, it brings our humanness to bear. That means we are limited. We can't do it all. There is a point that we can reach. Still stressing on them, man. In life, there are things that you cannot help yourself. You need somebody to help you. And as I speak, I have talked about other things that you may have people, people that will help. When it comes to salvation for your own life, you can't do it. You need a savior. And that is Jesus. So as I go through this, I will also want you to look at the other side of it. That If you don't have Jesus in your life, you don't have salvation. And it is not something any other can do for you except Jesus. Put that in your mind. We will get back to it. And coming back to my analogy, I was looking at this traffic light again. And a lot of things started coming to me. And I thought it would be worth discussing because we are learning about lessons. We're taking lessons. Anything that will teach us something about life, some wisdom about life, so that we will know how to walk and walk well, that will be worth touching on. So, in life, you may have dreams. You may have aspirations. 
You may have visions, you may have expectations, but some of these can be grounded depending on the situation that presents itself to you or the circumstances that you find yourself in. In fact, for some of us, we might have given up our dreams or our visions, our aspirations and expectations because of where life has put us. But I'm here to encourage you that that is not the end of it. When I was young, there was this plaque in our room that I loved. I didn't seem to understand it so much. It read something like this. The downfall of a man is not the end of his life. When there is life, there is hope. As a child, I could memorize it. And even now, I remember. It is teaching us something about life. That the fact that you fell today, that doesn't mean you are falling tomorrow. And of course, the fact that you didn't fall today, too, that doesn't mean tomorrow you will not fall. So life brings challenges. But when there is life, so long as you are still in this body and you are breathing, there is hope. And this is the hope that we want to focus on. That regardless of what we go through, there is something ahead of us that is good. Naaman was sick. He was leprous. And as far as leprosy was concerned, it is a different ball game altogether. Yet, his life was not, that was not the end of his life. His life was not supposed to be tied in that way forever. There was solution. But I also want to bring to your notice that the solution may not actually be where you are. You may need to find it from somewhere. Talking about Naaman. Now, let's come and glean some few things about the traffic light experience. If you have ever driven through the traffic light, you will identify this with me easily. One, you see in the traffic, last time I mentioned that you may be going and then you have to stop at the traffic light. And I was just casually bringing to our notice that sometimes you stop and you think that people are just passing by and you are stopping but because it's a traffic light if they move on they may also be trapped and then they will have to stop but some few lessons here that we want to look at carefully at the traffic light if we are relating it to life i'm not saying life is traffic light but rather I'm saying that you can understand some few things from there and relate to life in fact that can lessen the burden of the pressure on you sometimes challenges in life break pressure and this pressure alone is enough to disable and destroy you not the, the the challenge itself but the pressures that come with it a little understanding a little wisdom into this can help lessen the burden and you can take one step at a time so at the traffic light when you stop at least you are not moving it gives you the chance to be able to think about other, of course, you are on the road, you are going, but the stop means that you are not moving again. So it will help you to be able to think and then reflect on other things. In other words, the stopping can be a time of waiting. You wait, you can't go, you have to wait. In fact, some of us, we have to be slowed down in life in order to wait. We are too fast. <coughs> Sometimes you may not know. You may need to give time to traffic light. Maybe you are speeding so much that the traffic light just stopped you. And then before you move again, you have to, of course, uh, accelerate uh, bit by bit. And then maybe that policeman didn't get you. But from where you were coming, if it had not been the traffic light, <coughs> you would have been in trouble because you were speeding too much. In life, sometimes you may need to be slowed down before you end up in the ditch. In the ditch. As I talk about this, I want you to look at it from different angles. Sometimes, don't forget, there might be even a tra uh, uh, an accident ahead of you. You might skip it because you stop at the traffic light. In the same way, sometimes you may stop and then that will rather end you up in an accident because after you stop, then the issue of the accident is out ahead of you. You want to balance this as you look at the traffic light experience. But then you wait. One thing about the waiting at the traffic light is this. Whilst you are waiting, you are even able to look around you and see things around you that you may not have seen before. And I want to put this challenge to you. You might be driving on a road for all your life and you might think you know the road very well. <laughs> 
You can come out of your car one day and then stand at one point and look around. You see that even though you have been passing there all the time, there are a lot of things on that road you haven't seen. Yet, you drive. So at the stop, you are able to see things around you better. Many of us, maybe, life will have to present situations to us that will give us a pause, cause us to wait, and we will be able to look around, at least to see things around us. I will be fast with this. Sometimes, when you stop at the traffic light, you can get other people also stopping there. Some of them may be good people, some of them may be bad people. Some of them may look at you with some eye. Some of them may give you a smile. That is life. When you are waiting, when you feel like you are stuck, sometimes you can get pe good people coming to you. Sometimes you, you can get bad people coming to you. All of them have their comments. In fact, some of the comments don't help so much. And the fact that you have stopped in the traffic light and somebody coming to meet you doesn't mean that is your end. You, let me give this scenario. You see, you can go to the hospital and somebody may see you at the hospital. I'm talking about Neyman. With the caliber of person he was, having leprosy, you will see that will be so disturbing because people might think he doesn't have any issue. He doesn't have any problem. And yet, there was a problem. So your problem, your challenge in life doesn't mean you are good for nothing. Don't hide. Don't run away from people just because you have one issue or the other. Every one of us have our own. They may not have told you. So be confident to face the challenge that presents itself. That is the point I'm trying to make here. So over there you can see, whilst waiting, I'm giving an example of another, another example about somebody who has gone to the doctor. He may go to the hospital or a clinic. You see, people can easily comment, but their comments don't, their comments don't necessarily mean they are right. They may see you at the hospital and say, you are sick. Of course, sick people will go to the hospital. But don't forget even that there are nurses and doctors who work at the hospital. They are not sick. They go and work. So there are people, there are people who clean at random place. There are people who are delivering um, 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 drugs, medicines. They are all there. But maybe the fact that they saw you at the hospital, they thought you were sick. You might be worried that people know you are sick because you are in the hospital. But it's possible that is the day you are going to register for a certain practice. Meaning that you are going to see the doctor for a checkup or to register even with that uh, doctor. You are not sick. You only want to get a doctor. They saw you, they commented, they, 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 they said you were sick. In their ignorance and you are worried about this. Or it could even be that you were sick one time and then you went for a follow up. Now that you are home, you are fine. You went only to tell your doctor how well you are doing. But somebody has concluded you are sick because they saw you at the hospital. I am bringing this again to you that don't get overly worried about people around you. Rather, seek for the solution because every one of us have our own issue. And sometimes, as I said, the comments you might hear may not be so pleasant. Somebody who has not married yet Somebody would meet them and say that, so when are we coming to your wedding? Have I invited you yet? Have I told you I have somebody to marry? But such a question is supposed to prompt something in you. You become more worried. Oh, so they are all waiting to come to my wedding. Another person will tell you that, oh, we are all praying for you. It will be well. You see, that can push you forward. And then another person says, has anyone come yet? Maybe they have somebody to give to you. And then... <laughs> or somebody was there. why don't you want to marry? If I don't want to marry, is that even your business? But all these things have different ways of affecting you, bringing to your mind some of the challenges. Okay, let's come back to the traffic light again. Some lights, some traffic lights are too long. They take too long. Some is just a short time and then you are going again. So you also want to look at it again. Life can present situations to you and then you might be in it for a very long time. Some kind of disease can come to you and it will spend quite some time with you. Some come and they are gone. Some kind of joblessness can visit you. It can take a while. Some may come and they will go. You want to understand that this is part of life. This is part of life. Another thing that 
but you also want to look at, at in fact with the traffic like your patience is also tested sometimes somebody may cross you just stop in front of you and if you're not careful some of the things that you may want to vent out to them you want to be careful as to even how you speak your patience can be tested remember there was this man in the bible called job i believe most of us have heard of his story he went through so many challenges and at some point the wife told him that why don't you curse god and die you see sometimes that's how human beings behave and i was telling myself this wife too uh, if you want to die why don't you die and go in peace why curse god it tells you the bitterness in the heart of the person curse god and die so sometimes in our in our troubles in our challenges if you are not careful you may bring certain things out that it will be difficult to swallow back you may wish you never said it you may wish you never did it you may wish you never got yourself involved in but it might have been that patience is very important when it comes to these difficult times i've told you these challenges ground us in fact they tell of our humanness meaning we are limited in our limitedness we want to allow god to operate we want to be patient rushing will not help us if you rush through the traffic light when it's red you will get a ticket you know that very well sometimes at the traffic light it can be green all the time in fact you will be moving on through the the road and then it is just green it is just green i remember one time I was sent to an assembly and then I was sent to go and preside over there and the first day that I had to report I was I prayed everything prepared fine I am going to do the work of God but somehow something interesting I was going and then I saw that all the lights were just green green and I just convinced myself that well maybe things are going to be smooth for me no issues no problems and then along the side I so I got the red lights, one, two of them, then I felt like, okay, maybe there will be few problems. I'm just making a point here. And really, the Lord took me through. Few problems. Difficult ones, but I still through. What I'm trying to say is that you can be on the road, and then all the lights can be green for you. Somebody, too, can be on the road. Every traffic light will trap them. Everyone, there will be red. Everyone, there will be red. Uh, we don't know who is controlling them for you, but that is the situation you are present. So in life, you will see somebody moving smoothly as if they don't have any problem, they don't have any challenge. That is the road they are off. You cannot be in their shoes. You may also find somebody, it's like almost every time there is something to deal with. That is life. I'm presenting life situations to you. And then also, another interesting Another interesting thing is that you will be able to, when you get to the traffic light, sometimes to, you may not even know the rules very well, traffic regulations. And some traffic lights are said that if you have to turn to maybe the right and it's red, you can still turn when there is no car coming. I remember I was driving with somebody at some time. He came from a different place. I was at a different place. And then I was able to move. And he said, oh, over here, are you able to do that? Oh, where I come from, if you do that, the police will just arrest you. Meaning that even though it's red, you can't just turn. Other places, it's red, you can turn. When you can turn when it's red and you are not turning, if people are behind you, they will be blowing their horn, telling you that, go, 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 you are wasting our time. So there are times in life that you can be trapped, there can be a solution right beside you, you may not know. So not knowing even some traffic rules, can delay you unnecessarily at the traffic light. You want to take note of that. So, talking about, and, and by the way, some traffic lights can be faulty. They can just be faulty. So, it's not no fault of anybody. The fact that they are faulty, you are standing as red, and then you, you are not moving. So, they just trap you in life. Meaning that in life, certain things can happen to you that are not supposed to be there. You want to take note of this. These are just ways of trying to let you look at life differently. So that in other words, situations present themselves to you. You are well able to contain them. This is just traffic light experience. 
as he relates it to life. Now, let me come to our story again as we focus now on the characters that we are seeing. Naaman is leprous. There is a girl in the house. And this girl, if you... Let me go back to the reading. I want to capture something here. Then verse 2 says, And the Syrians have gone out on raids. This is my version here. So when we say you are going out on raids, it's not a pleasant experience for those who experience it. They are going to take things. They are going to take the spoil. They are going to bring destruction. So that in itself is not a pleasant experience. So listen. And had brought back captive a young girl. That is all I need from here. They went on raid. In other words, they scattered things around in somebody's country and they brought back a girl, a young girl and this young girl, they didn't just bring her, they brought her back as a captive, meaning she is not of herself. She is a captive. You can call her a slave girl. She was waiting on Naaman's wife. In other words, she was serving Naaman's wife. But then her country had been raided. And then now she has been brought to another country and she is supposed to serve. She is taken captive. This is the background, a little background of this girl. I'm picking the characters now. And the first one I'm touching on is the little girl, the young girl that was in Naaman's house serving the woman. If she is serving the woman, that means she is serving Naaman also. Okay. And I don't know. It may not be any fault of her. Sometimes we wonder why bad things happen to good people. That is life. Uh, things can happen to anybody. I told you we are in an imperfect world. <laughs> and sometimes I wonder, you see somebody with a bald head, no hair on the head, but yet a very, very long beard. And <laughs> if you have your own way, you may just want to transfer whether transfer or transport or export whatever is here to the top. It doesn't work like that. That brings the limitedness of humanity. And with this, there isn't much we can do. So this little girl finds herself in this situation on a foreign land. But the interesting thing that I find about this girl, let me touch on some of the things about her. She somehow she got to know that Neman was leprous. Of course, she's in the house. The way people who dress outside is different from the way they dress inside. So maybe somehow she got to know. And she suggests to the mistress, to her mother, to um, Neman's wife, that if only my master were to be in Samaria, my hometown, he will be healed. I gave you a little background of this little girl, this young girl. And she is telling the woman that there is solution for this. By the way, the fact that she is telling them that there is a solution means that in all of Syria, Neman had not had a cure. Even if there was, he had not found it. In fact, when you continue to read, you will see that the, the verses just flow like that. As soon as the, the girl has told the wife, it's more like Naaman went straight to his boss and then told him that he wants to be healed and he has to go to Samaria. So it, it suggests to her that there was not much delay, which means if there had been any other solution, he would have gone for it in his own country or he might have tried something and it didn't work. Whatever it is, we see that he needed that healing so badly. That is the point I'm trying to make. That there was no reason for him to delay. It also emphasizes that whatever was happening to him was something that was disturbing him. Yes, there can be situations in life that can be very disturbing. But I'm still here to tell you that all is not lost. Once there is life, there is hope. You might tell me, even the little life I have in me is growing. As I speak to you, I inject life into you because
because this is the word of God. And the word of God has light. I pray that even if you are going through situations and challenges that seem to be getting out of hand, the Lord will bring that little girl into your life who will speak and tell you where you can find solution. And I'm here to present to you that there can be no other solution for your life but Jesus. The one who came and died for our sins so that we can be reconciled back unto God. He is the one who holds your life. He knows your life better than you know it. I told you we are limited as humans. So no other human being can promise you anything that will last except the one who made you. He is the only one that can take care of that. So little girl, I call her little girl, young girl, in the house. And remember, we are learning about lessons here. She is on a foreign land and she still has faith in the God of Israel. She has traveled as a captive. Not by will, not by choice. She has every reason to say that my God has not been fair to me and my God has not been faithful to me. Why should he allow me to be taken captive? And yet, on a foreign land, she still remembers that she has a God. She is confident about her God to the point that she can even recommend to somebody that there is a prophet in my town. And when you go there, the God of that prophet, meaning the God of that land, can heal you. How many of us? When we travel to different places to hold fast to the faith that we have. I remember I went with some group of people for a call somewhere. And then in the evening, the, the young men, especially one of them, will be moving around. And then they will be chasing whatever has to be chased. One time, one of the ladies in our group said, but you, you have a wife and you are doing this over here. And then said, one country one wife. So what is trying to say that I'm in a different place so let me behave differently. Uh, I'm not too sure whether he was a Christian or not. I don't think he was. If he was, maybe a part-time one. But the point is, that story may not be unique to that person alone. Some of us, even, and I'm saying even, in church, we claim to be Christians, we go to other places and our lifestyle changes. We have become somebody totally different. I'm talking about lessons that we can learn from this story. Now it is the young girl. On the foreign land, she has not forgotten her God. Have you forgotten your God in a foreign land? Well, maybe your foreign land may not just be moving from one place to another or one country to another. But even in your own life, you move from one job to another job. You were maybe a, a, a secretary at one office. Now you have been moved to be a sales manager in another company or another office. Do you still hold fast to your faith? And you still trust in God as much as you did before? Now for sales, money will be passing through your hands. What have you been doing with that money? I remember some years back, I was taking care of our school van when I was on campus. And then there was a time that we were doing what we call body works. So that means they needed to do some reconstruction on the car. And it was a, 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 a van, school bus, if I should put it that way. So I had to stay on campus for a while while people were away. And then I'll be visiting uh, they call magazine or whatever to, to work on it. I went to purchase some items for the car. And the man who was writing the receipt told me so. He told me the amount, the total amount. And to me, that was the end of the story. And he was asking me a question that I didn't seem to understand. That So should I write the same amount? And I nodded my head that yes, without thinking about anything. Because to me, if I bought this for four and then you want to write a receipt, you put four on it, you write my date for me and I'm gone. He asked me about three times 
And I seem to be a bit confused. It was later that I got to know that some people, when they are going to do certain work, they inflate the figures. They will bring you a receipt, all right, but the actual thing didn't cost that much. I'm talking about Christians. Even in church, you see people, they will present the receipt. <coughs> it will interest you to know that even people can make what? what? Pastries. Pastries. And then, if it is supposed to cost 50 cents, they can make it one dollar, right? After all, this is my opportunity to shine. This is the time for me to also uh, make some money. I'm talking about your faith. How well are you keeping your faith? We have heard of instances that somebody can travel to one country and behave they have not married before. They can make arrangements and then go and marry again. What do you think you are doing to your life? This little girl, young girl on a foreign land, still remember her God, even though she had been taken captive. I want you to understand that. She had been taken captive. If anything at all, she could be better. But she was not bitter. She was not bitter. I am stepping up into this. <coughs> My time is up. I will be running up. Next week we are going to continue from here. This traffic light then came today. But I'm building on something that will let us look. I have been reading the whole passage for a reason. So that when you go, you can practice reading it by yourself. And so long as you read it, at least some of these things will be popping up to you. So you don't want to read it just like a casual reader. You want to read it with understanding. And begin to look at these lives. On the foreign land, she's still holding dear to her faith. You went to another place and this man came around and said, I'll be paying your bills. And what again? I will buy you a car. I will rent a house for you. And he said, who does it like this? You are not married to him. And you know his demands. And he said, oh, well, everybody is doing. How many of the everybody do you know? And then your friends have even advised you that you, you keep on with this Christian, Christian thing. You will die. Since the time passed after now, are you dead? What makes you think that you need that advice to be able to survive? Yes, life is hard. It is difficult. It is challenging. One time I heard a story about a lady who was on campus, secondary school, like high school, boarding house, and then she had to wait. Life was so difficult that she had to wait for people to bath. After they are finished, sometimes you see people bathing and that you are called the, the, the broken pieces of their soap. She has to go and gather them to go and bath. <laughs> people make mockery of her. People laugh at her. But she felt she needed to hold dear to her faith. She's a woman. <laughs> well, you ask me what is so special about that. Women will tell you they have a cuckoo farm, right? They can go out there and then, well, they can settle that in a short time. First advice. Why not? After all, they are all in the soup. But this woman feared the law, regardless of the land, regardless be a foreign land, be home, outside home, she knew she had a God. How far have you come with your faith? The lies that you tell, and then it's blue lies, yellow lies, and then gold and green, whatever lies, you paint them to give a face to it, it, to it so that it will be acceptable. This girl, a slave girl, a captive in a foreign land still held on to her God, trusting in her God, holding fast to her faith, even to the point of telling other people that my God can do this. I don't know how far you have come in life. Maybe you are presented with a situation that you want to compromise your faith. I'm here to tell you that there is a lesson to be learned from this little girl. Hold on! to your faith. Because the God that you have put your faith in does not disappoint. He is a faithful God. In fact, you will hear me today, you will hear me tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. I will keep on saying He is faithful because that is who He is. Faithful. If only you will be faithful in serving Him, you will see His faithfulness. I pray that if you have gone through challenges and you are almost at the point of giving up, giving up your faith, May the Lord strengthen you and give you another revelation of him so that you will stand firm in your faith. I'm ending here next week. 
We are going to pick on this little girl again and then we will move on. But remember, she told the man that there is a place that you can be healed. I will touch on that again next week. I stress on the fact that she kept her faith. Wherever you are, it's not too late. Maybe you have compromised your faith. You want to turn back to your God. This morning, I don't know, maybe you are on this line. This morning, I'm going to do a rededication. Maybe you have fallen back. You have once given your life to Christ, but you never stood against the test that you faced, and you have drawn back, wallowing in sin. This morning, you see the need to come back. That is not time for you to compromise your faith. You want to turn back to your law. Sometimes you weep that I didn't used to be like this. How come I am in this life? There is hope for you. In fact, a bright hope. I speak life into your life now. That come back. Your Lord is still waiting for you. You want to surrender your life again unto him. Rededicate your life unto him. I will be praying with you shortly. But maybe you are also hearing my voice. But you don't have any relationship with God. And life seems to be having its fair share on you. You don't know where to turn to. Jesus came to be our savior. That he will save us from the bondage of sin. Give us eternal life. And also help us make it in life. You can't do it on your own because we are limited as humans. You want to surrender your life to him. If you want to do that, you want to lift up your two hands with me as a sign of surrender and repeat this prayer after me. And then after that, I will pray with all of us. If you have lifted up your hands, you want to accept Jesus, repeat this after me, please. Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner and that you died for me. Therefore, I accept you as my Lord and personal Savior. I will serve you all the days of my life. Amen. Please put your hands down and then for those who have seen the need to come back to your Lord. Maybe you drifted off. I want you, I want you to put your two hands on your chest. As a sign of coming back to your Lord, rededicating your life unto him, even as I pray with you. Father, in the name of Jesus, this morning, the entrance of your words bring us light. And in this light, we see where we have stumbled and we see where we need you. We cannot do it on our own, therefore we come before you. I pray and I lift up all those whose hearts are yearning for you. And therefore they have surrendered that you will be Lord over their lives. Even as they have confessed you as Lord. I pray that you will secure their life. You will give them the assurance of their salvation. That they will know that in you they are secure. I pray that they will grow in you. To see your faithfulness. For those on this line. Who due to one reason or the other. The other that they may not even be able to explain. They have been trapped in life situations. And some of them have drifted off. They used to be part of the flock. But now they have gone astray. And they that are on this line hearing my voice. And need to re-surrender, re-dedicate their life unto you. I lift them up unto you. That Father, you will touch them again. And you will bring them to the fold. I'm praying for all my hearers on this line. Even as we are taking these lessons. Even as we look at characters and learn from them. We pray that wherever we fall short, you will give us the strength to overcome. This morning I pray, even as we read from Jude, that we will contend for the faith, not compromising our faith. We live in challenging times that our faith is tested.
affected in so many different ways. We pray for grace that we will stand the test of time, holding dear unto our faith, regardless of where we find ourselves to be. We are grateful unto you for this morning. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Beloved, God richly bless you for the time to be on the line. Next week, God willing, we will continue. I told you this is a teaching. So we are going step, step by step as we are directed. And I'm believing the Spirit of God to minister something specific to your heart. For those who have accepted Jesus, I want to encourage you to find a Bible-believing church where you can fellowship with them and grow in the Lord. I fellowship with the Church of Pentecost. You are welcome to any of our branches to fellowship with us. Until we meet again next week, I want to encourage you do not compromise your faith. Hold fast to your faith. For there is a great reward for that. May the Lord bless you. See you next week. Bye-bye.